Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is our fifth maternal gift economy breaking through series hosted by Genevieve Vaughn and the International Feminist for the Gift Economy. I'm Leticia Lason, your moderator. We're delighted to have Genevieve and Cheeky Estrada with us today. Both guests will speak before we have our Q&A. Check the bottom of your screen for the Q&A icon. Enter your questions in that Q&A. The chat box is gonna be open during the um, speaker's talk. And uh, if, it's, if it distracts you, please remember that you can always close that down. We're gonna to be together for the next few hours. So please remember to hydrate, take care of your body's needs, stretch and move around if you need to. Today's salon is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our website, the maternal gift economy movement.org. So let's begin. I'd like to introduce Genevieve Vaughn. She is an independent researcher, not to mention a friend to many, who lives part-time in Italy and part-time in Texas. She created the Multicultural All-Woman Activist Foundation for a Compassionate Society and founded the Sekhmet Temple in the Nevada desert. And she co-created the network, the International Feminist for the Gift Economy which continues today. Her books are Forgiving, A Feminist Critique of Exchange, Homo Donas, and The Gift in the Heart of Language, The Maternal Source of Meaning. She has edited, edited El Dona, The Gift, Women and the Gift Economy, and The Maternal Roots of the Gift Economy. In 2019, she edited a volume for the Canadian Women's Studies Journal dedicated to the maternal gift economy, which came out in 2020. And that is um, available online for free. And I would recommend it, as is most of the books that Genevieve has written on her website, the gift economy, gift-economy.com. So without further ado, Genevieve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leticia. And uh, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I really think that the, the gift economy as based in mothering, which is unilateral giving since children can't give you back an equivalent of what you've given so they can't have a market exchange with you when you're taking care of them. Uh, this uh, has in it uh, the secret of saving our planet and our economy and recreating uh, a better um, relation among all of our species and with the other species on earth. And what has happened is that we have not recognized the mothering economy that, that has a, a logic of its own. And instead we've embraced an economy of exchange, which is giving in order to get back. It is um, a quid pro quo. And so it's ego oriented instead of other oriented, uh, whereas mothering has to be other oriented because the child can't even really tell you what exactly it needs, at least in the beginning. So the person that's taking care of the child and that can be uh, even other people in the family, um, like the father could do mothering um, and uh, other people in the community, even a whole village can, can take care of the 
uh, intricate needs that a child has. And you, you have to um, concentrate on the other person, on the child, in order to figure out what the child needs. So you are, you're paying attention to the other person in a very uh, detailed and uh, specific way, um, which is different from the market exchange where you produce a product and it can be used by anybody and it can maybe satisfy their need and maybe it doesn't. Uh, so with, with mothering, you have to be in an interpersonal relationship and um, that establishes a mutuality and trust between the nurturer and the nurturee so that there is that, that original relationship is set up and um, it is also actually continues throughout life, that logic of that re relating continues throughout life, but we've learned to not see it or to say it's something else. Sometimes we, we don't think of it as, um, uh, uh, we don't think of it at all as an economy, but it is actually uh, a way of satisfying material needs to start out with and it's free. And so it is a free economy uh, that is actually quite similar to the economy of nature um, that we are able to receive from nature. So um, we don't recognize that this uh, interaction as economic, but it is, an, it is a kind of economy that everybody experiences in, in early childhood um, because they can't survive without it. Um, humans are just born very vulnerable and uh, more so than other species. And, and we have that specific um, need or group of needs that somebody else has to satisfy. And so they, they have obviously done it over the many centuries and, and millennia uh, because we have survived as a species, but otherwise we wouldn't be here. And, and we're not gonna continue to be here unless we put that way of being into action uh, and in the forefront of the way we value things and of what we do, because now instead, what we're doing is a market exchange and, and capitalist exchange where we commodify everything. And uh, instead of looking at needs of people, we're only looking at the profit that we can make. And, and every, um, every interaction becomes um, a, a, a buying and selling. And that is, and we've been validating that as well, so much in the neoliberalism. And, and uh, we, we can't um, even now, we can't produce vaccines and give them free to the people. We have to, people have to, the, the companies have to make billions on, on, the, on the things that are gonna save people's lives. So I think, um, our values have been distorted by capitalism, distorted by the exchange economy. And um, we, we have allowed that to happen because we have not recognized the fundamental importance for humanity of this giving and receiving way, this unilateral gift way. Um, there are anthropologists who have studied various uh, indigenous groups and seen that they had gift economies. Usually uh, these, that what they say is that uh, there's giving, receiving and giving back is the main um, underlying theme of that uh, kind of economy. But it really, the giving back is not a necessary part. The, the main part is the giving and receiving, and then somebody can pass it on or they can take turns. But it's not a, 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 a I, I give you this only if you'll give me that. 
I think we've been looking through the glasses of the exchange economy at everything. And so we expect everything to have to have a payback. Um, but babies certainly don't know that maybe in some long, far future, they may be expected to take care of their parents in, in their old age. Uh, so there is no exchange really involved in that. They're just, uh, there's this model of the unilateral giver from the beginning, from, uh, from as soon as a baby is born and comes out of the, uh, out of the, the womb, um, the, they have to start breathing. And there's that gift of air already coming into your body and then giving, be, being given out again in the out breath. And so we continue that and we live in, a, in, a, in the air all our lives, breathing in and breathing out, get, and receiving and giving and receiving and giving. And, uh, and, and even your blood circulates in your body out to the, out to the cells and nurtures the cells and comes back and is uh, nurtured again in the heart and, and receives oxygen. So uh, these are cycles that are physical, but we do them also in with uh, with each other, and uh, I think we've we've lost that paradigm. We're not looking at it, and uh, we're what we're only looking at um, ways of manipulating each other in order to 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 get more. And uh, what happens in the, in the exchange economy um, is that the whole exchange mode exploits the whole gift mode. And uh, when the, you know, they talk about uh, the surplus value of the extra work that workers are, are doing that is not paid for in the price of the salary, uh, that extra is a gift. And so is the domestic work that women do in the home and taking care of the house that's unpaid work all that flows in to the salary, uh, to the uh, unsalaried work. And uh, from, and the, then there are all the gifts of nature as well. All that free from, from, uh, from the air to the water uh, and to all of that various aspects of nature that unfortunately now are being commodified by big companies that are commodifying the water or um, the seeds that that used to be um, taken for free from the previous um, harvests uh, are now being substituted by terminator seeds that you have to buy from from some big uh, company that um, is some some big capitalist company. Um, and and it puts people more and more in a um, in a kind of a, a slavery situation to uh, all of these big companies that are then ripping off uh, uh, the populations and and taking all the gifts of the world and and channeling up into the billions of dollars that the people uh, at the top are, are making, the, the, uh, the 1% or the even 1% of the 1% are, are making all of these billions and uh, trillions of dollars. Um, and while the rest of the, uh, of the world is um, barely making it, m many people in the rest of the world are big, barely making it. Some, something is really, really wrong. And I believe that what is really wrong is the fact that we've excluded the whole mothering way from, uh, the, the, from the forefront. And then the, instead we put in this uh, mechanism of a market that is, is not even a really human mechanism. It, it comes, uh, we've imposed it on top of, uh, of our um, better selves. And in fact, I think uh, up until about three years old, children don't understand um, the market and they don't understand buying and selling, but they do understand giving and receiving. And that is one of the most important 
uh, models that we have for all of the things that we do. I, I've uh, worked a long time on, on trying to show how language is based on giving and receiving, on, on communication is, uh, the word communication is made of co, muni, and cation, and muni means gifts in Latin, and of course co means uh, together, so giving giving gifts together is communication and community is also made from that same uh, word. So we really, our communities are made by uh, circulating gifts among us, uh, but it is now uh, being, uh, we're being separated because exchange just separates us instead of uniting us. And it, it is, I think, uh, an, an exchange for money is even worse because it, it's, it separates people in a hierarchy. And, uh, and so uh, my desire is to scale back from, uh, from the exchange economy, step back from the exchange economy and bring forward a gift economy based on mothering. Uh, there are many people talking about gift economy now, the, uh, but in general, they don't see anything uh, uh, special about mothering and in, involved in it. Uh, mothers uh, need to be recognized as the real foundation of the economy and of uh, especially the gift economy. And, and it, instead of having a, a, some kind of a non-monetary exchange as a necessary return, we don't even really need that. In fact, we need not to do that because the gifting is other oriented. You concentrate on the needs of the other and that gift gives value to the other person because they're important enough to you to, uh, to satisfy their needs. And so I call that gift value that you give to the other person. Um, and that helps the other person have more self-esteem because she or he realizes that the other person cared enough and thought they were valuable enough to satisfy the need. This starts out in childhood, but it happens also when we're, when we're older. Um, and I think we have not seen that part of, of value. We haven't understood that that value, it underlies the other kinds of value because um, what we have instead is exchange value, which is the value of the, uh, uh, of the commodity and not the value of the person that's involved. And so the the, the gift value is separated into exchange value and use value when it is, uh, when it is in a, a commodity. And uh, the, our whole market is, is made on not giving value to other people. Um, so we have to really change the kinds of, of human values that we have and that we're putting into action. And I think it's really, a lot of the time we look at the, this unilateral giving as, as morality, uh, but it's not actually morality, it's economic. It's, the, has the, it's a basic logic that human beings have to do and in a, for a long time because children need uh, unilateral care for many years. Um, and and we, we do that and we, we have become, I think, uh, wh what I call homo donons, not just homo sapiens or um, uh, homo economicus, even worse, but homo donons, which is the giving being, not, the, uh, not just the knowing being, because we don't even know that we are the giving being. We've, we've, we've um, canceled that whole aspect of things from our, our 
knowledge of ourselves as a species. And so it's, what is important is to restore that, to, like they say, to have a new narrative of who we are as a species in order to not believe that, uh, that we deserve the kind of suicidal um, end that we are preparing for ourselves on this planet by destroying nature and, um, and, and each other. Uh, so we need to realize to have a self-respect as a mothering species. We are the most mothering species that there is because we do it in all kinds of different levels, in, including language, I believe. Um, and, and we have by embracing the market and allowing the market to, uh, to take from us it all the time um, at, at many different levels, uh, we've, we've ruined our, um, our potential and we've ruined the, our ability to live in peace on earth. So my kind of feminism is a feminism that is based on another economy, an economy of mothering, an economy of, of care and uh, of, of unilateral giving and receiving and that logic that is involved in that. And, um, and so I'm, I believe that the, the um, usually also the problems of gender are, economic problems in the sense that they take on the values of the exchange economy instead of the values of unilateral giving and receiving, and which are actually the values of community. So uh, what we need to do is form communities that are based on circulating unilateral gifts and educate um, our children and and each other our, ourselves as adults to move in that direction and to start validating that kind of um, interaction instead of the money making and um, the values of the exchange economy. Um, those are values that sometimes they they may seem pretty good but actually they aren't there. Um, they, they, they are values that um, uh, have to do with um, that manipulation and uh, forcing other people to do things without uh, letting them even know. So lying, for example, uh, is not other oriented. You, by, when you tell the truth, you satisfy the other person's need to um, to understand and uh, and to uh, know what's going on. Their cognitive need. Uh, if you lie to them, you're you're not satisfying their need. You're satisfying your own. And our whole economy is based on this false advertising. And, and, and now we've had so much false news also that all of that is made to satisfy the need of the person that's putting it out, not the need of the person that's receiving it. Uh, so we see it at a lot of different levels, how um, the exchange economy takes over from the gift economy. And uh, uh, we do it through a lot of things like um, our, even our international relations are made that way and, and our, our, um, our war business. Uh, we, we, we fund enormous amounts of armaments and we don't have the money for the, um, for the basic uh, care in, in our domestic economy. And, and at the same time, we destroy other people's countries and don't let them have a, the um, ability to have a gift economy there. Um, so we, we are, we, we're in for a, a, a deep change. We have to have a deep change and it's gonna have to come pretty soon because we don't have much time. Um, you know, it was, 
three years ago that that the UN said we only had 12 years before uh, the, the feedback loops uh, of, of, in, in, of climate change were beginning to make every, the earth unlivable. So it's urgent. And we do have this uh, maternal uh, capacity. Everybody has it. Everybody has it because everybody is, has been a baby and they have experienced the model of somebody else taking care of them unilaterally. So everybody can do that. Um, we have learned not to, but it's very important for us now to reveal that model as important and a good model as the only real model that has been, has been excluded through um, sexism for one thing for, for so many centuries by patriarchy that has placed together with the market has placed the power over uh, syndromes in, in place of the um, mutual nurturing and the sharing and uh, the passing on of all kinds of gifts, including the gifts of language, the gifts of culture and, um, and care. So um, this is what I've been trying to promote for many years. And I do hope that uh, you can see more about the gift economy and the maternal gift economy as uh, time goes on. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. That was wonderful. Yes, so we need to un unlearn what we've learned about the exchange economy and reveal uh, the heart and the core of what it means to be human with our unilateral gift giving. And we need to um, begin at the beginning with helping our children. And that's where Cheeky comes in. So I'm going to introduce Cheeky Estrada, who's the owner of La Casa de Bambini in Kyle, Texas. Supporting children to reach their full potential in a holistic way is her passion. Guiding children's self-development by linking them to the activities in a prepared classroom and outdoor environment is her calling. Chiki was born in Guatemala and moved to the United States in 1976, where she began her journey with Montessori as a teacher's assistant in 1977. After training as a guide in 1978 with the association Montessori International in Atlanta, Georgia, she worked at several Montessori schools in Austin, Texas. Cheeky met Genevieve Vaughn in 1986 in Austin and was introduced to the gift economy. In 2002, with the help and support of Genevieve, Cheeky was able to open La Casa de Bambini, which combines the philosophy and practice of Montessori and the, with the gift economy. Chiki is gonna be talking to us about the gift economy in preschool education. Thank you, Chiki, for joining us. Um, good afternoon. So my name, as Leticia said, is Chiki Estrada, and I am happy to be here to speak about how gift economy and Montessori intersect and how both are promoted at a small Montessori school in Kyle, Texas. My journey to find gift economy was a long one. I am from Guatemala, a Central American country and came to the United States in 1976. Soon after I had my first child who inspired me to become a Montessori guide. And I have been a primary guide for 42 years. <laughs> I learned about gift economy through a midwife in the late 1980s. At that time, midwives were struggling to continue to help pregnant mothers and the medical association wanted to ban them uh, from delivering children at home, claiming a high mortality rate for babies born at home. The midwives needed a space to work and organize 
And there was a gift economy program in the East Austin where there was a house and they were able to use it to do their checkups with the pregnant women to provide the Lamas classes um, who were classes that will help you to have a, a child through breeding so it will not be so incredible hard. And they also have the place and the opportunity to organize their, their case and, and present it. Um, I saw the whole process and in the end, the midwives were able to continue their work. And that's what, that's what when I met Genevieve. Um, I, from that time, I became part of a group of people that were learning about gift economy, about how to create new venues to give and, um, and, and, and try to find the very strong patriarchal idea that money is what gives human hair or his value. There was so many ways that we work to spread the philosophy. There were art projects, there were programs from the less privileged, there were radio, TV, training, all designed to help those around us and to share information about the gift economy. We were able to gain experience in creating gift economy projects. And as I spend more time with this woman, I learn about giving in a very untraditional way. It was giving based on, not on the patriarchal established way of giving, but giving without expecting anything in return. That was shocking to me. It was giving without question and how much money you made or how you're gonna spend it. It was based purely on the fact of satisfying a need. We had so many questions and so many, many ideas. Many of these women were their own way and tried to imitate the practice and principles of gift economy that we have learned. That included me. <laughs> I had had the honor of working under two visionary women who in their different way have made their lives work to create a better work for all of us. Genevieve Vaughn, with her vision of economy free of monetary exchange, based on human value and caring, for which if we practice, will satisfy the needs of every participant. And Maria Montessori, who developed a way of teaching children based on satisfying all their developmental stages. At the turn of the 20th century, Maria Montessori observed how children had within themselves the ability to develop if given the necessary tools. And she created the Montessori Prepare Environment, an approach to early education that had the potential of achieving a world of peace. In the same way, Genevieve considered the gift economy philosophy, which is based on unilateral gifting, starting from the mother to her children, knowing that the baby cannot give anything back. She gives from her heart. Maternal gifting given puts this philosophy in practice in everyday life. Gift giving educates the human fellow, helping them to understand we do not need to exchange money for things. We can learn to give things for the joy of meeting a need. The monetary exchange created a world of greed, competition, and lack of compassion to our hum human fellows instead of inherently valuing others. Our system puts a tag, a price tag on us. Just as the doctor should be able to have a good living, should the janitor. In our current system, laborers usually need to work to the limit their bodies can endure and is still barely making it economically. Why? Because our society put price tags on our jobs and they decide who is value enough to live a life with all the necessities and who will remain poor. 
it has been interesting on this 2020 year. We really saw which roles were essential while our system was happily to expect these essential workers to continue in their labor. The majority of their, them have a life where they live from paycheck to paycheck. Montessori is a program recognized around the world for early childhood education, yet it is not affordable for most families. In 2002, the practice of the gift economy allowed the La Casa, a small Montessori school, to operate on a property in Kyle. Our tuition at La Casa is, is the lowest tuition in Austin, Kyle, Buda, San Marcos, and all its surrounding areas. Since the 2002, the school has given the gift um, around 450 families of having the opportunity to send their children to a Montessori school they can afford. In Texas, there are only three Montessori schools that serve blue collar working families, one in Houston, one in the east side of Austin, and La Casa in Kyle. While there are several Montessori schools, they serve more affluent communities. The system of education currently used in the states and around the world train children to be like robots. It almost takes away their humanity. Train them in a way you would a factory worker and one teaching fits all system that does not easily allow them to make choices. The system ultimately hinders their intelligence and takes away the thinking process and does not allow them to create responsibility. Most children in school cannot even use the restroom unless they're given permission. The Montessori works on the principle of having an environment specifically prepared to support children development with a guide who works with children of both genders. Since the activity are not gender exclusive, it allows boys to interact without restriction and encourage them to freely express their feelings. The environment is prepared in a way that does not promote choosing work according to your gender or to identify with the stipulated colors like blue are for boys. Boys as well as their girls learn nurturing behaviors as they develop relationships with their peers, as they care for the young children in the classroom and undertake practical life activities designed to encourage the development of community and independence. For example, boys and girls in a Montessori classroom take care of the environment. They sweep, they mop, they take care of plants, they participate in making food. The guide directs direction is given without expecting the children to perform in a set way, similar to the principle of gift economy of not expecting anything in return. Not as the patriarchal system chosen way of education, which stresses the children meet the expectations on how, how much and when they are, they are to achieve the knowledge and prohibits them in participating in activities that are created for a specific gender. For example, boys are discouraged to participate in learning how to dance ballet and girls are discouraged to participate in football or any contact sports. The Montessori approach changes the way children will grow up to think. Society including the traditional education approach condition us to think under the patriarchal paradigm. Montessori is not based on acquiring knowledge and not based in a specific gender roles. It is centered on supporting children to develop into healthy, happy, conscious and responsible human. The environment is relational, which creates gifting 
a re reciprocal relationship can only exist with interaction. In the gift economy, the giver interacts with the receiver. In the Montessori, the child interacts with the adult, with peers in the environment. The education is preverbal. We know that children already have principles of logic that leads their growth before they are able to express it with words. At 18 months in a Montessori classroom, children are given a great variety of experiences through materials presented by the guide in lessons. They interact with peers and all this before they can properly speak. This allows them to express themselves as their language begins to develop. Philosophers, scientists, researchers have identified identify how a spoken language directs our hearts into actions. The usage of positive language, include, including the word no, is used constantly in the classroom. This repetitive phrases help create in the human a positive outlook of life. Also, understanding how mistakes are a very important part of learning. When a mistake is made, the action needs to be repeated. In many cases, the mistake is made again and the cycle of repetition continues. A child learns patience and perseverance, a process that can only happen by having made the mistake and trying again. It is repetition that develops the ability of not giving up because it is through the trying again and again that the goal will be reached. If the words of the guide are encouraging, it can help the child manage any feelings of frustration, concentrating on the inherent, inherent value of the effort and the beauty of the mistake. This does not mean that the guy is not being truthful. She helps the child hone and on what needs his or her attention to be successful, but reframes the experience as a new challenge instead of an obstacle. As words are kind with relating to each other, they learn to be kind. The guide encourages helping each other with awaken the awareness of someone else needs and gives positive personal reinforcement when being helpful to others. In this way, we develop a community and then a society that loves giving for the sake of giving. Our patriarchal, patriarchal society seems to resent giving because the receiver is expected to act in a certain way. When they do not meet the expectations, the so-called giver gets angry, resentful, and will not be willing to help anyone anymore. Another factor which promotes gift giving and it is contrary to the patriarchal establishment is the lack of traditional punishment in a Montessori classroom. The prepared environment in the classroom allows for logical consequences. If a child breaks an object, and instead of shaming her or him, they are made responsible for the cleaning of it. Of course, with the assistance of the guy to ensure safety. It explains how because of a broken item, we now need to wait to do the activity until we can replace the broken object. This helps the child learn to care for fragile things. And also things are not always able to be replaced immediately. After a few days, the guide is normally able to bring the exercise back onto the shelves and children will notice. When the children work with an activity, it is the responsibility to prepare it and have it ready for the next person before it is put back on the shelf. If a child decides that they don't want to complete the activity, the consequence is that they're not ready for the next one. If a child takes something away from another child, the logical consequence is that she or he is taken, is asked to reflect and speak about what made them decide to take it away. 
That guide usually needs to help the other children present their sides and express the emotions and responses from having something taken from them. Many times the child will take something simply because they want it. When it happens, the guy explains, even if we really want something, we must respect the other person and wait. When a child hurts another child, she or he will be responsible of participating in the process of caring for injured child until they feel better and until the wound has been bandaged. The child who, who is hurt is given the opportunity to exchange points of view with the supervision of the guy and help to understand what is acceptable behavior. When there is a child that is being disruptive or aggressive, their freedom of movement and participation is removed or limited until she or he can understand the appropriate way of acting in a peaceful manner. Oftentimes, this means staying much closer in, in much closer proximity to the guide or to the assistant in the classroom. Freedom and discipline are directly related. Independence and responsibility to others are opposite side of the same coin. When children or grown-ups are being punished, it is based on the will of the person in authority and what the person decides that is needed. Consequences, on the other hand, are the results of our own actions. Social development, the arena in which the maternal gift economy is taught, enables the children to experience at a very early age responsibility toward the environment and their classmates and to be perceptive to the needs of others. They leave less inside the funding so the next child will be able to use them. The social development in the classroom environment promotes awareness of the interdependence each individual has with another and with the environment. If they need the guide's attention and she's given a lesson, they need to wait, thereby promoting patience. Children are encouraged to ask older children for help. Again, this is a plan tool in Montessori to help them see their dependency on each other. It is contrary to the idea of me first or only me. Such, such a strong characteristic in the patriarchal establishment. The kind of interaction fostered in the classroom help children cooperation. In the traditional education setting, competition is highly promoted, promoted, which it promotes greed and disappointment, lack of care for others, and is it destructive to the person and to the community as a whole. The Montessori classroom is a constant movement of cause and effect giving a strong understanding in how we are interrelated with peers and with the environment, which is the universal act of giving and receiving. Plants need us oxygen, we give them carbon dioxide. We plant and care for them, the earth gives us food. We care for animals and they are our best friends and food respectively. We are natural givers and receivers. Nevertheless, the system has made us believe differently. In the Montessori environment, children are taught to work out problems by speaking with each other about incidents. The aggressor will be taught to be responsible and the person that is harmed will be taught to express herself so she doesn't have to become a victim. The aggressor will help and talk to the child and that will help him to understand that he needs to change their ways of acting. It will make a connection because of how it affected its peers. The person that has been harmed is given tool to stand on her ground and not accept maltreatment or disrespect. 
The practice helps show the children how to live in a society of respect and peace and how to repair relationships when things go wrong. The more we compare the principles of Montessori with the maternal gift economy, the more we see how they complement each other. Of course, they were both developed by great visionary women. Again, gift economy gives value to people. In the Montessori classroom, the guide works toward helping the child achieve a balanced sense of dignity through making choices, which enhances human intelligence. The process of the activities allow them to successfully materialize their ideas through constant practice and repetition, not in the forced way, seen in traditional education, but through promoting the self-efficacy natural to all balanced children. The language used in the classroom needs to be precise, respectful, and caring. It is by the spoken language that we direct our hearts, which directs our actions toward other people. In the Montessori classroom, the respect shown toward the prepared environment, the guide, and the other children creates an environment of reciprocity. The working together is the continual giving and receiving, the ongoing exposure to this cycle of giving and receiving teaches principles of compassion, love, and care. The classroom is a constant moment of cause and effect, giving the children the repetition of the experiences and creating patterns of acting from within. The values presented in the classroom day in and day out are of dignity, human value, justice, communication, relationality, interrelation, unilateral gifting, and more. As the children achieve coordination of mind, eye, and hand, that, which is the base for Montessori education, the children will reach the mastering of themselves and of their environments. Gift economy and Montessori education give the opportunity to help all children, particularly young boys who are strongly denied by patriarchal system and their paradigm to become people who nourish and are compassionate givers. Gift economy and Montessori work to abolish the established patterns of greed competitions and selfishness, which promote destruction and in, in human, unsympathetic, merciless joy, which has created the unfriendly, violent society we live in. Gift given in Montessori education promote peace and caring. Both teach us to collaborate with each other Giver and receiver promote cooperation instead of competition. Gift given in Montessori educates solve, educate us to solve problems and promotes communication. Gift given in Montessori education train our minds to enjoy differences. Gift economy and Montessori education give the receiver value and does not take away a person's dignity for being in a position of need. Instead, it helps us understand that all of us at certain points of our lives need someone to give us through love, compassion, and care. It makes us recipient of beautiful feelings that cannot be bought. It creates love and gratitude in both the giver and the receiver. Well, until that time, when we will live in a total gift economy, La Casa participates in gift economy by giving low tuition compared to the traditional Montessori school, which range from $2,700 a year to $7,950 a year. Uh, that's why our school is a place where people that works can afford. 
as a practice of the gift economy when the La Casa families find themselves struggling financially as a result of divorce, loss of a job or becoming single parents or many other reasons which prevent working classes, people from sending their children to a Montessori school. La Casa makes it possible for the children to stay in the program by not requiring any payment. La Casa also gives three to five scholarships every year. The parents of La Casa are presented with the gift economy philosophy and encouraged to practice it in their lives as much as possible. As La Casa role models the gift economy principles, we create a garage giving that we have annually and we have working parents day in the school where the parents and the teachers and the children work together to make this school even more beautiful and that gives opportunities to all to give and to all to receive and we try to create as many opportunities through the school year it is a gift itself to see parents learning and getting involved as they see their children desire to give. Most of our families are so busy trying to make ends meet that they will not even hear about the gift economy if it would not be because the children are in this kind of environment. Many parents had said to me that since being a part of our program, they have a hard time imagining how people live without the gift economy before. Well, those are all my experiences, and I hope that it helped you to understand that we can give in many ways. And like uh, Genevieve said, also helping with money, because at the end, it is an economy. It's the maternal gift economy. Thank you. Cheeky, that was so fabulous. I learned so much. Um, I wasn't familiar with the Montessori program and the way that it can complement so beautifully the gift economy. And it creates an opportunity for uh, many other people who will be viewing this to understand how at a fundamental level, we'll be able to infuse the educational system of children, especially now during the pandemic that they're at home or the parents have a little bit more influence. So thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank so, you. Uh, yes. So um, if you have questions for our speakers, please remember to put them in the Q&A. And I'm going to ask Joan if you can um, share a question for us. Sure. Um, shall I start with Cheeky? I, I, I have one here from Rodrigo and he's asking, can you explain more about why the Montessori goal is not learning? Well, amazingly enough, when Maria Montessori started her program, she was not interested in teaching the children how to read and write. She was interested in helping the children to be healthy and be involved. And she saw that they were all these needs that they have from the beginning of their life, like the need of uh, food. So they make noises so mom knows that we're hungry or when they start rolling uh, because they want to move from one place to another or when they, um, you know, uh, want to reach for a toy so they start crawling and so she saw that they had all these developmental stages and then they were they it was very important for children to be able to master their environment and understand it and she based it on that because but being a doctor and always being told that she had to be in education she has started to create materials that will promote education, but it was more for them to develop their senses of the left, the, 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 the left to the right or grasping of how to pour themselves a glass of milk. Uh, and she started introducing uh, solids and shapes for them to manipulate. And so they can trace and refine their motor controls. And so, 
it really, the gift was of becoming a full accomplished human being that can give, can love, um, not somebody that knows a lot of math and language. Now, the joke about it is that as the Montessori started to work, uh, the people in education realized that they are more and more prepared and that they can read much better, that they understand that their math skills are incredible, that their connection and how they can discern from a shape to a solid is enormous. But Maria Montessori was never into teaching them how to read and write. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I really think that that was very thorough. Um, Liliana, are you here with us with a question? Yes, I have a question to Genevieve from Nat Z. He says, mother gift is natural. So is the fact that to eat, we take some parts of life, parentheses from plants, animals, etc. So what to answer to this patriarchal view which values violence to take? I think um, that mothering, in a way, it, in some ways it is natural, but it is actually work and it takes a lot of consciousness and uh, a lot of uh, doing. It's not just natural. Um, it is, and, and as I said, it lasts throughout life. Giving and receiving are the basis. Unfortunately, uh, this model of giving and receiving can also be distorted. And I think it is also the basis of giving hits. Hitting somebody is transferring uh, energy from one person to the other, but not to nurture them, to control them and create a, a hierarchy um, of power over. And so I believe that, that uh, the violence is a distortion of giving. And then the vengeance are, um, is a kind of payback. It's a kind of an exchange. So one person hits and then the other person hits back. And so there's the exchange. And uh, that seems to produce some kind of justice, but it actually doesn't. It stops the giving. Both of those uh, areas are, uh, are a distortion of the maternal giving. Thank you, Jen. Joan, do you have another question? Yes, I have, this is for Cheeky, uh, and this is from Amy McHenry. And she asks, can you tell us a bit more about garage giving and the different ways you shared gift giving economy with parents at your school? Um, in the United States, I'm not sure that this happens in every country of the world, but people usually put their goods on their garage and people mm -hmm. that is driving by uh, see if they need it and you stop and shop and you reuse, which is a good thing to do. Uh, but usually there is a fee. Is usually a smaller fee than what you will pay for the item at the store. So at La Casa, we created garage giving. So all the parents and the staff will bring all their goodies and we will put them all outside the school. And when the people will come and, you know, they are used to garage uh, sales. So when the children, when the people will come and they start choosing things and then say, well, how much is this? Then we'll say, oh, it's all free. And so there are two reactions to, oh, it's all free. Uh, there is a reaction of that, oh, no, no, but I wanna, I, I, but I wanna give you something, you know? Uh, and, and we go, oh, no, no, this is all for the community. If you need to take it. And we try to um, say something that I learned of gift economy, take as much as you need. And so there have been some times when people comes and they load a whole truck and the parents are saying, no, tell them no, tell them no. And we go, no, we will allow them. And they will have, you know, their own consequence, good karma, bad karma, whatever. <laughs> Maybe they need to go and resell it. I have no idea. So we let them. And through the years, 
those people that used to come and fill up their truck, now they bring some things to us and they only took what they need. You know, and so that's the big difference of the garage giving and the garage sale uh, here in the States. Uh, you know, we, um, we try, like this year, we asked the parents to give the homeless because the pand pandemic being so horrid. And so we thought we will try to reach the homeless. And so the school bought boxes of um, hats and mittens and scarves to give the homeless. And the parents start bringing all kinds of incredible healthy snacks, waters, uh, all kinds of pretty things, bandages, um, and we make bags and, and the children took them home and they passed them to the homeless. Uh, you know, um, we have uh, the blinds in the school were given by a six years old. Um, he, he, we were cleaning and painting the school and the, the blinds look really ugly and kind of not really nice looking. And the mama said, hey, I'm gonna buy blinds for the school. But she asked her son, can I use some of your money until my check comes because he had some savings. And he said, yeah, sure, use it. And so um, the mom went to buy us the blinds. When she got her paycheck, she told the, the, the boy, okay, so I borrowed this much money, so I'm gonna pay you back. And he stopped and thought and he goes, and I'm gonna just give them to the school. It's okay. And he didn't want to get payback. And so I could go forever <laughs> telling you things like this. But this is some um, some few of the examples. And thanks for asking. Thank you, Chiki. Liana, <laughs> do you have a, an, a another question for us? Yeah, I have a question for Jan. This is from Robin Nikathane. In the second of the salons, one of the speakers introduced the idea of chosen maternal clan. I think this could become a core practice for us to begin nurturing the shoots of the emerging new story in our lives and thus making it alive in the world. Is there any wisdom or perspective the speaker could share with us on how we can bring the principles of maternal gift giving and kingship into our daily lives, as well as working together as a movement? Well, yes, um, I, I think that having the idea of the gift economy, realizing that gifting um, and unilateral maternal gifting is the model that that will, that needs to uh, overtake the model of exchange and be used instead, um, validates all kinds of activities that are along those lines. If you don't have an idea that to, to guide you or to a framework to, to uh, refer to, then it may happen that you just feel like you're acting good. Or people may say, oh, you, you know, you're generous. Well, it's not a question of being generous. It's a question of changing society as a whole to make the society generous. Like, like we used to have this foundation for a compassionate society to make the society compassionate instead of cruel as it, as it, as it is. Um, so any group that wants to create a, a, a um, a maternal community, a, a, a matriarchal uh, community needs to have a framework that they can look at it in, in order to, um, to make decisions that are informed by a common purpose and a common understanding. And without that, I'm afraid that, you, that people kind of go off in every, every direction. Um, and it also helps to explain to other people that are not in your community what it is you're doing. So that's that's my advice on that. Thanks, and Jen. Good luck. <laughs> good luck. Um, I, I do want to point out that the last uh, comment in the chat, there's um, uh, an entry there 
in as an invitation for people who want to explore uh, uh, creating a chosen maternal clan. There's an email address there, maternal gift gifting kin at gmail.com. So those of you who are curious and want to uh, continue a dialogue with people who are just beginning, somebody is offering a gift to be able to organize that conversation. Um, what I also would like to point out is, you know, in the, in the number two salon, um, there were two different strategies, frameworks that were actually presented. One literally from the ground up in Colombia, where you had land and you came together. The other is more akin to um, the Matra clan where, that you were talking about, a chosen group of people. But Jen identified the framework and Alessandra Piccoli actually put up slides that showed you um, the plan that their community actually went through. They're in the three-year plan right now. So the first year she identifies the strategy, the second year she identifies the strategy, and then the third year where they are now, she's talk she talks about where they're going. The key thing I think is both Chiki and Genevieve pointed out, you can't do it alone. The gift economy is not something that you do alone. You need other people, okay? Um, Heide also um, in her, in our last salon, number four, Heide spoke about it and um, Barbara uh, Mann also talked about from the indigenous point of view that you could get some tips and again, Heidi is doing a, a two-year program on modern matriarchal studies that's going to be online. So that's also a resource for you. So Liliana, do you have another question for us? I have a question for Chiki. Marcella Clark is asking, Chiki, beautiful work you're doing. Can you expand on how you're able to survive during these difficult pandemic times? Are you able to tap into state resources? Uh, the school uh, is, uh, the school has asked for, um, for donations. And yes, we uh, have uh, been able to tap on some resources. Um, honestly, the big thing for us was the families of the school, uh, which took an incredible part on it. And many of them paid their tuition, regardless they having the service. And then sadly, many of them also said, no service, no payment. And we hope to keep working at that they understand. But it was at this time of the pandemic that we saw the gift economy in action. It, it, it really was amazing with our parents. They supported us. We, we didn't work for two months. They paid their tuition. Enough parents paid their tuition, so we didn't have to close the school. We were able to continue to um, pay the teachers. Uh, and so it, 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 the pandemic made it very, um, to me, it made it very real how gift economy really works because I am part of this little community that talks and practice gift economy all day long. And, and, and yeah, we did survive it and the pandemic make gift economy be very real. Thanks for asking. Thanks, Chiki. Joan, do you have another question for us? Yes, so this question would be directed to Jen. And this is from Doug Zachary, and he asks, in what ways are Marxists particularly challenged in understanding gift economy theory and practice by loyalty to our male-centered and thereby limited interpretation of historical materialism? Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, let's see how I can do with that. Um, 
I, um, I, I wrote a book, my first book that I wrote um, started in the, called Forgiving, a Feminist Criticism of Exchange. It started with the line, both capitalism and communism are patriarchal. And that is really the problem. Um, so I think that the gift economy uh, is maternal. It has this maternal basis. And men ha have felt, in, at least in, the, in um, let's say the Northern societies, uh, men have felt that they were not maternal. They have had a kind of gender uh, education that has made them in some ways give up their maternal values and, and in doing that take on those more violent uh, aspects of uh, that perversion of giving, which is violence and hitting um, in many, also in sort of metaphorical ways. And, um, and so I think that actually, I, don't, I think Marxism did not actually address what women do. They didn't, it didn't address the gift economy. It only addressed the market and, uh, and capitalism and, and, and uh, the, the workers' movement. And so it left out this, this whole aspect of analysis that isn't there. And I think, you know, that I say that giving gives gift value. Well, Marxism starts with exchange value and use value. And so they, it, 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 it ignores the whole gifting side. Uh, and and uh, it is the gifting side that will, will save us. Um, so I, I think that Marxism tried to give the gift, uh, a big gift of social change and a big gift of justice to workers. And, um, and maybe to arrive eventually at some society where, where gifting could happen, although they wouldn't have thought of it as that exactly. But, um, but I think that we have to be able to spread the gift around and the idea that uh, that um, from each according to his or her uh, capacities to each according to his or her needs is a very good uh, motto, but it also has to include the ability to give again and for the gifts to be able to go around and circulate. And uh, I think that really the the whole Marxist project was was stopped by patriarchy, and um, that the capitalist project is patriarchal in in essence. And so neither one of them have worked. We need a, a mothering uh, economy. Thanks, Jen. Um, Liliana. Do you have another question for our speaker? Yeah. Yes, I have a question for both of the speakers, Chiki and Jan. And this is from Laurie Amy. On the relation between Montessori and the maternal gift economy, I am reminded of the core relation you make, Jan, between the gift and language. Chiki, the discussion of what learning means makes me want to make this connection. A fundamental aspect of learning language is learning how to understand and move the body. The relationship between body and space, other learning first, what are the names for mother, father, juice, food items, learning body sensations and to differentiate between hunger, thirst, thirst, needs to urinate and defecate, body training, etc. All of which makes me want to say the mechanisms and process of learning per se are in fact laid down in these early years with language and body. Jen and Chiki, would you agree th with this perception or not? Can you discuss? 
Tiki, you want to start? Yeah. Sure. Whoever you want to. Well, you start, and then I'll do. Um, I, 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 I do agree that um, the development at an early age is precisely that the awareness of your space on your surroundings and the needs that you have, as you said, food um, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, learn how to use the restroom. And so I, I do believe that when these needs are met at an early age in a positive way, uh, without shaming the children, it just really changes the way that they developed. And it also changes the ways that they relate to each other. So I, I could say that generally, I do agree with, with your comment. Um, it is important, it happens at an early age and it's about a space and mastering our environment. I'm not sure that that answered the question. Genevieve. Okay. Um, so I think that our environment around us, um, and including our own bodies, um, is can be seen as as nurturing, as a as a collection of gifts, and and we give gift words um, that correspond. To the gifts in our environment. Um, there's an interesting um, psychological um, theory about how about affordances that uh, items in our environment have capacities, affordances, like a chair has the affordance of sitting on. Well, that I look at that as the, as the gift of the chair, the gift that the chair gives is the ability to sit on it. And the same thing, I think, with various aspects of our bodies that have the capacity to, uh, to do things and to give gifts and to receive gifts. So they have that, like a hand is, uh, is, is a gift in an, and, a, and a, a giver of gifts and a receiver. It has all of those affordances. And so that, that is what our words correspond to, is these various affordances either in our bodies or in the environment. And, um, and so we give each other these word gifts instead of giving each other the environmental gifts. And we relate to them together in what is a, a joint uh, perception of things together with uh, the other person we're talking to. So, so it really is a different, um, let's say, um, layers of gifting. Thank you, Jen. And thank you, Chiki. Joan, uh, do you have another question for us? Yes, this one is for Chiki. And it says, this is from Sharon Barnes, who says, thank you for this informative and clear presentation. And she, she wonders if you have any suggestions for those of us who teach in traditional institutions about how we could incorporate these practices in our classes as well. Where can we start? Um. One of the jobs that I did is I work for uh, the public schools uh, as a consultant, and I, I was teaching them about um, how to merge Montessori into traditional education. So the best way to start introducing it in a, in a, in a public school is just, just to get acquainted. If you have a Montessori friend, ask her to show you how to develop the materials and then bring them to your classroom and start um, working with them. Of course, Montessori is not just about materials. It's about the whole environment that is created through the work with these materials. As you saw in the pictures, 
the children are working by themselves most, most of the time. And they are very involved in what they're doing. And so they're learn, learning their numbers, their letters, how to count their shapes, their solids, their, 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 their continents, the states, the countries that way. And so it's done in a very peaceful way. So what a public school teacher eventually wants to do is to bring more and more and more Montessori materials and learn how to incorporate them, um, you know, with the tradition to allow the children to have this peaceful way of learning. And instead of forcing them to do letters right now, and then in 30 minutes, when they finally are getting into the letters, then you need to change to now we're going to do the science experiment, you know, and so that's really what creates the Montessori environment. But hey, I think that it will be awesome that you get acquainted with Montessori and with how to use the materials and bring them to your classroom. Thanks, Chiki. Jen, do you have any input to that question? Any suggestions that you might add? And maybe not necessarily in the Montessori way, but how you could bring the gift economy uh, into the classroom and support support um, teachers. I don't really have much, but I I would say it's really something you need to talk about that that the teachers can talk about. They can they can also uh, encourage gifting when it comes up, uh, validate it when it's there already. Um, and uh, read things and stories and that kind of thing that have to do with gifting for the kids. That's, I'm sorry, I don't have a whole lot to say. Well, actually Jen has three books, three children's books that she's written. <laughs> so, so that's one thing that you could do is to include Jen's books in your curriculum. And that will give you a framework uh, that you can, see in stories um, that are written by other authors. And then the fourth thing is also, Jen has an album that she wrote of songs. So you can have them incorporate the music as part of their curriculum as well. And you can find that, I think Diane put uh, the website up so that you can find those things. So those all would be wonderful things for children to do in a traditional classroom. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Jen. And thanks, Cheeky. Yes, I would imagine that it would be quite difficult to incorporate the Montessori because uh, in traditional education, it's quite rigid in everybody doing the same thing. Very industrial age uh, focus that everybody's doing the same thing at the same time, forced into a little box. So. I want to applaud all the educators out there and thank you for even considering including the gift economy because we need it at all levels, the awareness. This, you know, there's sort of a crack in, our, uh, in the fabric of our culture right now. And we have an opportunity to let the gift light shine in wherever we can. Um, Liliana, do you have a question for us? Yes, I have a question for Jen from Marcella Clark. And it says, Jen, it, it, is it inherent to human nature to be selfish and not to think of the other? Why then humans are blind to the gift economy? Yes, um, I think that, uh, like I said, I think that the, uh, the, the gift economy is the basic economy, but exchange contradicts gifting because you can only give in order to receive or you only receive when somebody um, uh, when you've given something and so um, it contradicts it. it it cancels the gift and it exploits the exchange process and capitalism and uh, money exploit the gifting and so they hide it and that's the reason um, that it is one of one of the reasons 
I think patriarchy is another, but uh, that's one of the reasons why um, gifting is not seen, um, but it's there and we do it a lot. And we've all learned not to see it even when we're doing it. You know, you, you see somebody on the, the, on the street that looks bad and you smile at them and that's a gift. There are all kinds of ways that we satisfy needs and we don't even recognize that. And so we think we're much worse than we actually are because we're, <laughs> we're caught in this sort of, yeah, I think actually exchange is a kind of parasite on, on gifting. And we're caught in this relationship of host and parasite and, and the host doesn't recognize itself. Thank you, Jen. Chiki, I wondered if you could offer some insight because children are also humans and <laughs> they're, they're at the very beginning. And uh, if you had some words to offer to this question. You know, the reality in a classroom is that the environment outside the classroom is very, very strong. And so, you see children at a very, very early age laughing if somebody gets hurt uh, because the environment tell them that it's funny when somebody falls and has a failure or something. And, and so they also, they have tendencies, but I, I, I strongly believe that if the environment that they are is an environment of compassion, then when the children are in the classroom and they laugh because the classmate uh, tripped on the playground and they think it's so funny, ha ah, ha ha, he fall on his face. Then we go, let's go see if he's all right. Let's go check that his face is not bleeding. And we tend to helping the individual and, and, and make them aware, because I think it's something that our society has. And I truly, truly believe that is the patriarchal paradigm that does make us feel that we're not givers and that it's not even cool to be givers. You're dumb if you're a giver, you know, who, who, who established this so strongly in society. And so if we change it to if I laugh because my friend fall and somebody tells me, oh, you love your friend, Harry, maybe your friend needs you, maybe your friend is in danger, that will bring some kind of awareness to me that I didn't have before. My awareness before is somebody trips, you fall. Now my awareness is if somebody trips, they might be hurt. Perhaps I need to be of some use in helping them. And the more that you do, the more that you integrate it. And that's what I said, this, this knowledge becomes within the children. You will be, I, I, I almost feel that I will be more educated to follow the children that have left the school because I hear these fantastic stories of them now that they're much older because they have these feelings within themselves. So, I, I, I do think that the way that we act to it and that way that we express it in the language that we use to connect it and the given of the responsibility is, 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 is a must because we know as grown-ups when we're going to all these sessions to see what's wrong with us, that the first thing that we need to realize is awareness. How did I get myself into this? Oh, I am get, oh, I am into so, so I feel like awareness is very, very important. So in making the children aware of the maternal gifting way of acting, and that's what I said in my talk, really, we don't realize, but this maternal gift economy is used every day, all the time. It's always present, it's always there. So that will be my little contribution to it. Thank you, Chiki. Liliana, do you have a question? I do. For us. This is a question uh, for Chiki from Doug Zachary. And he said, are there 
Montessori gift economy educational opportunities in the Kyle area as children grow older? Unfortunately, no. Um, La Casa tried very, very hard to, um, to get a charter school to make it so the children would go to a Montessori environment, but uh, we were not politically educated enough uh, to make it happen. So there is no Montessori school that is affordable to everyone in Kyle after, after you go to first grade. They, 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 there are many other Montessori schools that go up to seventh grade and even 11th grade. Um, they're mostly in Austin and, uh, you know, and, and, and you can call them and see if they have any, any, any gift economy in their structure to, to help all of us to beneficiate from it. Thank you, Shiki. Um, what is the age group that your children are? We are from 18 months to six years old. So they, they do first grade and then they leave. That's a fabulous chunk of formative time, isn't it? It is the strongest formative time. That's beautiful. Now, and how long has your school been there? Uh, since 2002. So this will be our 19 year 2021. 20, wow, I, I see a gift uh, research project to follow, <laughs> follow up on those children who graduated from your school in the early in, days. Yeah, I, I, and I sometimes them. wish that then I'm kind of one of the parents are so involved in the daily life that I, I unfortunately don't have this tragedy and the time to follow them, but it will be awesome. It really will be awesome to, to do that. Right. Well, we have a lot of scholars here who need research projects, so maybe one of them will, <laughs> will take up that project because that would uh, help us validate some of Jen's theory yes. um, in a very yep. practical way of how it lays down in the early childhood development um, in, in just the, that short period of time. So that's yes. very exciting. That yes. will be very exciting. Okay, I've lost track of who, who gets to offer the next question? So you're gonna to have to help me out. I think I do, it's Joan. Um, this one, Cheeky, this is related to what you've been just talking about. Um, it's from Makara Mali. And the question is, do you have a manual on how to start your type of school outside the USA? Oh yes, Maria Montessori, had it open, there's no trademarks on her program. You need to learn how to work with the materials. You need to work how to learn how to establish a classroom and you can go to any part of the world and open it. Uh, there is no, like I am from AMI, which is the most prestigious place because it's the international one, but you don't need any anything to open a Montessori school because Maria wanted everybody to be in a Montessori classroom. So she put no trademarks on, on, on Montessori. Anyone can go and learn it and practice it in their, in their countries. That's wonderful. Um, maybe we can uh, make sure that this, uh, the, the questioner can be in touch with you and uh, Love you. be able to. Oh. Yes, so that's, that you can help her find the resources and, and network. See, all of these gifts that are flowing right now, I'm actually really impressed because we've had so many <laughs> offerings and, and questions. So thank you, Chiki. Liliana, do you have another question for us? Yeah, I have a question from Marta Benavides to Jen. It says, uh, interpretation of the process share here in Spanish for people that are in dire circumstances. She's in El Salvador, such as indigenous local communities, rural communities, impoverished communities, and in particular to the urgency Jen referred to, 
the coronavirus and coming pandemics. Is this possible? We can work on this, a contribution to a world of peace in a healthy environment so nations could work at making each nation a sanctuary for its people and nature. Thank you. And I guess she's asking the possibility of how do we work with these communities in such a dire situation like El Salvador and Central America. I think that uh, what we need to do is to change the exploiters, not the exploited, that we have exploiting countries and businesses and things that are creating the, po the poverty that so many people on earth are living under and, uh, and are de destroying. We're also in the so-called developed uh, world. We're also destroying the environment that uh, for the people in the so-called less developed world. And so uh, the, the communities there are vulnerable to all kinds of um, environmental disasters and, and human uh, predation. And, and, and it's not their fault. It's the fault of the people who are, are participating in a deadly system, uh, in, in an exploitative system. And so we have to change that system. Uh, and at the same time, uh, help, if possible, the people that are trying to survive. Uh, but, but, I but I think that, that really we need in the, the so-called developed countries need to, to concentrate on changing ourselves and that that can be a way of, of helping uh, people survive in communities in, uh, in other places that have been devastated and also by COVID. And, and uh, I, what happens is unfortunately, the people get, there are, there are charities that are um, not really charities. They're for money-making. There are some good charities that 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 help, but it's, it can't be enough because the system itself cre recreates the problem over and over again. And uh, so I'm sorry. That's what I have to say. I know you don't know. So I I know, but don't be sorry that that's what you have to say. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't have a better, uh, easier, a better, an easier. Yes, but, these are big. I, I, yeah, I know when challenges. Martha is dealing with it all the time herself, I know because she lives there. So I'm yes, exactly, exactly. Um, uh, Marta said that she, she thanks you. I'm reading the chat right now. She has to leave, but um, that was why she made the relation to nations, creating sanctuary for people, but yeah. yes. Absolutely. We really need to do it at all levels of where humans engage, because without doing it at all levels, one of them could topple the others. So everyone has to do their part, their little bit, their little part. Um, I have a question. I have a question for Jen and Cheeky. I'm wondering if Cheeky you have a question for Jen. And Jen, if you have a question for Cheeky. I have been asking Jen questions for over 20 something years. Um, but um, gosh, uh, I don't have a question for Jen. I maybe have an, a statement to make about uh, about the, the the gift of have learned about gift economy and the awakening of of that it's it doesn't matter how little it is the work is important 
And if you can only give a little, then you give a little. And if you can give a lot, then you give a lot. Um, if you can do it just on, like Genevieve says, smiling to a person that seems to be in trouble in the street or giving uh, your money for a better cause, you know, it, it just doesn't really matter as long as you continue the giving. That's what I have learned from what she has uh, shown me and what she has uh, made possible in so many things. I was just talking to Genevieve about all the lives that I have touch, been touched by uh, from meeting, from knowing her and all the good things that I see happening to so many of us on so many areas of our lives. So I don't have a question, but I do wanna say to Genevieve, you are awesome to keep this up because we all need to be made aware, aware uh, have the awareness of how important gift giving is. I don't know if Jen has a question for me. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Chiki. I just have a statement too, that I think you just did have done wonderful things with the gift economy over, over these years and practicing it in a very down to earth and practical and real way. So thank you so much. And um, it takes all of us really, um, thank, thank, all, uh, thank you all that are in the gift economy, the maternal gift economy movement. Um, it's really um, a privilege to be part of it. And uh, yeah, Cheeky, I loved your presentation. It's great. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, Liliana, did you have a question? I see you unmuting. Yes, yeah, so I have a question for Jen that I received in an email. And this person, she's anonymous and she wants to know what is the relationship between global climate change and the gift economy? Well, um, I think that the first question is, what is the relation between global climate change and the exchange economy? That is the deadly relation. Uh, the gift economy is the solution to that. And the earth is the greatest giver. Uh, the earth provides all, all kinds of gifts. All, every ecological niche is a gift to every other and uh, to every creature that's in it. Um, we need to use that kind of an interpretation to, to understand the earth as, the, as a giver and ourselves as well. Um, the big problem is that by destroying the environment, we are creating a future for our children where they won't be able to do the gift economy because they, we will have created scarcity everywhere, destroying things where the gifts will be too hard to find and to give. Uh, so we, it is a, we're in an emergency. Um, and that's, that's the reason why uh, we need to do what we can. Thanks, Jen. I'm checking the time for us. Um, we are almost at the top of the hour. So I just wanted to ask if there were any other concluding comments that Cheeky you have before we actually close out? I, um, I think that what I will say as a concluding comment is that um, it is crucial and it is now and we all need to do as much of the maternal gift economy as we can. I think that that, was, that will be my conclusion for the talk of today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there is someone in the chat who's asking, I, I do want to put this out there because they want to offer their uh, volunteers uh, for the school. So I want to make sure that you save 
um, I want to uh, just note that if you go where the chat box is and you see the three dots and say it, click on it, you can save this chat so you can find each other and we'll make sure you're connected, okay? So thank you so much for asking that question. Um, and Jen, did you have any closing comments that you'd like to offer for us before we uh, close out the session? Well, I, I just uh, like to thank you all for listening and, and uh, for um, embracing the gift economy for, for now or for a long time, however you can. Um, and uh, I want to say there, there is hope um, and and uh, we, we may not see uh, the, the 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 hope coming up because things can look pretty dismal now, especially in COVID. And, but uh, I think we can do it if we become conscious. We need to really uh, experience humanity in a different way. And, uh, and guide ourselves in a different way towards a, a future that's good for everybody. And, and we need to realize capitalism doesn't work. It's hard, it's bad for us. And we can do much better in a different way based on the maternal gifting. Thank you, Jen. Um, Susan Huffman, I see your comment. Um, there will be a recording of this session. And so um, I'm going to get your email address. So I'm going to save the chat and I'll send it to you <laughs> and anybody else who needs it. Um, so I just want to thank everyone uh, for attending who's here now in the room with us. And those of you who are viewing this uh, recording when it goes up on our website and it will be at YouTube. So thank you, Genevieve Vaughn and Cheeky Estrada. It was just so wonderful to have you with us. And the two, um, with the gift economy and education so complementing each other because the challenge as adults in adult education, they're not very complementary. And it's a big challenge to try to infuse it back into higher education quote unquote, as I've been told. That's what it's called. Um, as a reminder, we do our salons every two weeks. Our next one is February the 13th with Maya Vasalo and Margarita Rosa Tejado. We hope you'll come and join us. Remember, you can watch today's video on our website. It will go up. It's the maternal gifteconomymovement.org. If you have any questions, you can contact us at maternalgifteconomy at gmail.com. So thank you so much. And we look forward to having you with us again. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.